very important again. Um, we have a wonderful guest tonight, but I'm not going to tell you about that wonderful guest. Uh, our lovely colleague in the band library, Kristen Dupont, who is sitting there, I believe, I with WB8. In the Burns Library, that's correct, Mike. You... With WB8. Um, so with, Kristen. With in, in multiple um, in figures and instantiations, right? You were commenting over my shoulder this uh, bust by Erotica Curran. It looks a little more like Darth Vader than WB there. And then there's a synonymous one that would kind of float in and out of our screen here at this time. <laughs> so Christian, if you want to take all your props and explain the evening, work away, please. I will, I will. And uh, thank you, Mike and Joe uh, and Lauren. It's great to see you. This is a very familiar place for, uh, for Lauren uh, in our Irish room. Lauren uh, was a, our burn scholar in the fall of 2017. And yes, I will give a little fuller introduction to Lauren in a moment here, but uh, You've also asked me to sort of set the stage here, as it were, for this series, right? So this is the second of a four-part series on the uh, Irish Literary Nobel Laureates. And so tonight we'll be talking about W.B. Yates having uh, visited with G.B. Shaw last week in Fintan O'Toole. So uh, there is uh, the lineup of our four gentlemen. Uh, there we are. Okay, This is a sculptural installation. We talked about this a little uh, more in depth that, uh, uh, with the sculptor Rowan Gillespie last uh, time around. So uh, this is a unique it's sculptural installation that uh, Rowan has created. Uh, there was an initial version of this in Burns Library. Those of you who have been here on other occasions have seen that. And this is a new version that has just been installed this last fall uh, in the entryway now of uh, our BC Ireland offices there on, on Stevens Green. So with Mike and with, uh, with Player and then theater. So you have to go by and see it once, uh, of course, the doors are fully open to the public once again. So this is a sort of virtual unveiling that we're doing here with this four part series online, uh, which will actually have a, a yet another rendition later this spring with, uh, we're working with Turlo McConnell uh, um, Communications to produce a four part video series that will include some footage and discussion uh, with Rowan about the sculpture works, a little bit more about some of the books and everything from our different collections in Burns Library that relate to the laureates. Um, and, uh, and then segments from this interview uh, series tonight, in this case here with Lauren and then our other speakers. So let me just say, to say a little more about the sculptures and then uh, before introducing Norma fully uh, about this uh, installation, how it's conceived. And it was actually, as we'll see when we get to Heaney, was really uh, our patron, uh, the Burns Library, Brian Burns, which is named after his uh, father, John J. Burns, our uh, class of 21 uh, graduate, that, um, that Brian was thinking would be wonderful since we have these literary collections in Burns Library and, and as they were represented the, the, lower, the Nobel laureates to have busts of the maid. So we thought about it, what about a bust of Heaney? And then it became a bust of Beckett. Um, and then he bounced back to Shaw. And then it was, well, of course we have to do Yates. So interestingly, Yates, who may be first in some of our minds, and certainly uh, uh, Lauren has <laughs> set us up well in that direction, um, was, was actually the last one to be sort of conceived and sculpted by, uh, by Rowan for this uh, series and presented certain challenges, not least his, his eyeglasses there. Uh, but Rowan had worked on other, uh, another major sculpture of Yates that I hope many of you have seen. Uh, I talked last time about the many sculptural, public sculpture installations that, uh, that Rowan has done uh, around Dublin. We also mentioned Titanica there in Belfast. But if you find yourself over in Sligo um, and you walk in front of the, I guess it's the Ulster um, uh, Bank, there is a, a plaza there which has a large sculpture, kind of life size of, of, of Yeats, but it's, um, it's a fantastical one in the sense that it has this kind of billowing cape of, with his words. And what you're seeing here on the pedestal of the uh, Laureate's installation, in fact, are words from their works inscribed. And that idea really came from that Yates sculpture that he'd worked up uh, in Sligo there. So, um, and he, he modeled and shows all of the verses uh, for that. In fact, uh, here on the very uh, front of the Yates pedestal, you'll see this, um, uh, it's the, the text of 1916. And Mike, you can go ahead and, and put my video back on here. Stop your screen sharing for a moment, please. Uh, we're all together. And um, so I just pulled from our uh, Leaming collection. Here's one of, the, one of 25 copies of the uh, private printing of, of uh, Easter 1916, which is there quoted on the front panel. And then the other selections uh, include um, Fiddle of Dooney, the Song of Wandering Angus, 
Uh, and then Brian Burns even had a little hand in this, uh, the municipal gallery because it has his favorite line in there. Think where man's glory most begins and ends and say my glory was, I had such friends. So that's what uh, we all are here on the Irish Influence joining week by week because this series, the Irish Influence of course, continues every Friday, uh, 4.30 p.m. Uh, and 9.30 in Dublin. So uh, keep an eye on the webpage and all the upcoming announcements and uh, for that. So let me um, say a little more about Lauren. Uh, and again, this is so nice to, to see you, but at some distance here, we feel that because it was so nice having you here as a, as a, a whole semester as our Burns Visiting Scholar in Irish Studies in that fall of 2017. Um, Lauren describes herself as a literary critic and cultural historian whose work concentrates on the intersections of literature and political change in the 20th century. And I think we'll get a very good sense of that from your conversation this evening with Mike and Joe about how broad uh, those themes are in your work, uh, much as it concentrates, of course, on our figure of, of Yeats here this evening. Uh, since 2019, and we think it, maybe it has something to do with that prestige of being a Burns scholar, uh, that you were appointed as a uh, professor of English at the University of Maynooth in uh, 2019, where you've been now for the, the past year and some half under this uh, regime of pandemic, but uh, many more years to, to come there. We congratulate you on that. Uh, before that, of course, you spent time at the University of Liverpool, um, about uh, almost 10 years, I guess, right, in, in different uh, increasing capacities there, and uh, uh, the senior lecturer in the Institute of Irish Studies. Um, major publications for Laura and Lauren include, um, in 2010, WB Yeats, the Abbey Theatre, Censorship, and the Irish State, and that's where you're seeing that, that uh, blending of themes that uh, um, we talked about earlier with um, uh, as, as Lauren describes, the, the, the scope of her work. Um, that was followed, interestingly, by a double biography of both Constance and Kazimir Markovich, uh, Revolutionary Lives, which came out with Princeton in 2016. Uh, fascinating study of those two figures, but uh, all along working on Yeats here. In fact, your new book is coming out, you're saying, this summer, right? And you're happy about it being delayed, in fact, for publication, so it won't just come out with all the other academic books in April, but with the uh, the popular and trade uh, books from Oxford in, uh, in July. And this is the poet uh, Rapallo, uh, the late modernist writing in Mussolini's Italy. And I'm sure we'll be hearing about that in your conversation this evening. Um, but beyond just the books, it's also, you're the founding general editor of International Yates Studies, uh, and you're currently editing with Matthew Campbell, the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of WB Yeats. Um, and you've been serving as the, uh, for what, this is the third year, and I guess final year is your, Directing of the Yates International Summer School. So, you know, who better than Lauren, of course, to speak with us this evening on uh, WB Yates's uh, legacy and future, not only though in this uh, Anglo Irish context, but we also like to think of an American global one. Uh, because for as much time as Lauren has spent living between uh, Ireland and the UK, she was born in the US, right? And <laughs> did your undergraduate studies at uh, Carson Newman College in Tennessee. Oh, uh, yeah, but then getting that Oxford PhD. So, anyway. Uh, a little background on Lauren and uh, to you, Lauren, uh, good evening, and to Mike and Joe, take it away. Thanks very much, Christian. Lovely, lovely, lovely introduction and uh, wonderful to see you there, actually surrounded by all of the paraphernalia of Yates that we have in the, in the Burns Special Collection. And uh, welcome to the audience and thanks, of course, as always, to the uh, Consulate General for their support in this enterprise. Lauren. Really nice to have you here. William Butler Yeats, born in 1865, I think. And his first poems published in 1885 and writing away there almost until, until the, the eve of the Second World War. Um, can you tell us something just about the, that, all of the things, the, the, the period that was traversed, all the changes in poetry that took place at that time? Can we think of maybe two or three different ways of maybe poetry came in maybe two or three different waves or anything we can say about it? Sure. I think one of the most important things is to think back about um, to his parentage. So he's born to John Butler Yeats and Susan Mary huh. Pelexvin. So the Pelexvins give him that connection to Sligo, um, those landscapes that we know so well from his poetry. Um, but his father's 
middling career as a painter gives him a sense of what it means to be an artist and also what it means to with the kind of precarity that's associated with an artistic life. And I think that stays with him through his whole career. Um, it's important too to his going um, to London where he really makes it as a poet. And that's because there's such a fashion for Irishness and Celticism at the turn of the 20th century. So then when he goes back to Ireland, he has a real sense of that of being an Irish poet and a real sense of wanting to be a national poet too. Um, but on that front, he has a very mixed reception because of what he represents in Ireland, being associated with the Protestant ascendancy, not being an Irish speaker at a time where what it means to be Irish is very um, hotly contested. It's about some very delicate um, negotiations. So um, he really achieves, he, he does achieve that status as national poet. Um, and he does that, I think, largely because of his work with Lady Gregory in the Abbey, the Irish National Theatre, which gives him that legitimate claim to be national, to have that kind of national platform. And all the time he's working in the theater and the publicity, he's getting through the Abbey. He's making his career internationally um, in England because of his networks in Bloomsbury and also in the United States where he goes on a series of lecture tours, including to Boston where he visits several times. Right, 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 right. Thanks very much. Do you, do you want to continue there? Will we leave it there? Uh, right. So I suppose actually it's just, just, it's just I'm thinking about, about him going to London and coming back to be determined, I think, to be this Irish poet, this great poet of Ireland. And when I look at photographs or paintings of, of Yeats and that, there's no doubt to my mind actually of how performative he is. He seems to be playing the part of the poet with great determination. I'm asking this question, Lauren, because last week we talked about George Bernard Shaw. And Fintan O'Toole also spoke about Shaw as being a person who was performing Shawness or shaviness, whatever the word might be. Fintan's point was that Shaw did this in order to create a version of himself that was kind of untrue, so that the shy, uneducated, quiet person became this boisterous, loud, self-confident person. I wonder if it's possible to say if anything similar happened to Yeats. We know who he was performing. Was there somebody whom he wasn't, who he was pretending to be? Absolutely. Um, when you look at his correspondence, when you see the film, like I think we're going to see in a little bit, you get a sense of his um, vulnerability, a sense of his anxiety wow. about his own reception, um, a sense of anxiety about his relationships. Um, and you do not mm -hmm. see that in the kind of edifice that is projected in his public speeches um, and his um, the persona that comes across in his essays. So I, I think he absolutely is a performer. Um, he performs different versions of himself for, diff for different audiences, much like Shaw being more Irish in England um, and less Irish in Ireland. Um, I think that we see that with wow. Yates too. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay. Thanks very I'm much, Mike. We meant, no, we mentioned, we just mentioned that film. I'm going to show it in a minute, but before we do, just to remind you all, please do use the Q&A button uh, and we'll get to those at the end of the session. Anything you need to know about Yates, Lauren's here to answer you. Um, so this film you sent me, Lauren, is really kind of dealing with the next question. Um, but before we get to that question, it is about the Nobel Prize uh, moment. And this film, if I can just share my screen. is the film of him uh, arriving in Stockholm on his way uh, to get his prize. Um, and I'll, I'll just play it and then you can maybe explain it to us what you kind of think is going on. Um, mm. Yes, there we go.
grand, 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 grand. So it's a lovely, yes. lovely video. Um, and Lauren, I mean, just to get onto that point, when and why did Yates win a Nobel Prize? And most importantly, in that trip, um, did he say anything significant during his acceptance? Oh, absolutely. So he wins the Nobel Prize in 1923, and it's awarded specifically for his poetry. And the committee says um, his poetry in a highly artistic form gives expression to the spirit of a whole nation. They don't mention anything else about his career at all. But yeah, it surprises the committee with an accepted speech that isn't about poetry at all. Um, he focuses on the theater. He talks a lot about his collaboration with Lady Gregory. He also makes very heavy references to the Irish Civil War. He talks about um, Gregory's ancestral home, Roxborough, which has recently been burned. Um, he talks about um, the, um, the way that um, kind of violence in Ireland has usurped, in his view, any kind of sensibility, but that an appetite for violence um, and kind of ignorance um, of the Irish people at the present time hasn't diminished their ability to recognize and remember what he describes as the noblest beauty. So we can see he's very much writing um, or speaking in Stockholm against the Irish Civil War and also making a case in that speech for the importance of the Abbey Theatre as an institution. He talks about the institution of the Swedish court and the way that it represents um, not only a family that's gathered about it, the rank, but also the intellect of its country, and the way that that is a, um, uh, an organic kind of Swedish institution that hasn't been informed, in his view, by any kind of outside influences. Um, and this is on the, on the cusp, of course, of um, the Abbey Theatre having got a subsidy and its, up, its application for a renewal of the subsidy. So he's thinking here about national institutions and the roles that those national institutions play in creating order in a nation. So it's a very surprising speech. Um, all that you know, seriousness and the kind of the very right wing aspects of that speech are offset when he publishes it as part of a long a pamphlet or a, a little book, um, The Bounty of Sweden. Um, the, he publishes the speech at the very end um, and he prefaces it by a long discussion of his journey to Sweden, which is very, very funny. He talks about going to Sweden via Denmark um, on a ferry boat from Ireland and the kind of food that he and George are served on the boat and their refusal of most of these kind of cold buffets that are set before them, um, usually because they don't recognize the food and sometimes because they do, like when they're served jellied eels. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very comic um, uh, episode that, um, that provides kind of counterweight to what he actually said in Stockholm and perhaps some of which he might like to retrench um, afterwards. And obviously, I mean, you talk there about his kind of his idea of kind of looking at Sweden as a state, he's had his political career. And I think it's the interesting thing about Yeats, you have Yeats the writer, but you also have Yeats who's so instrumental to the first few years of the Irish Free State. Yeats who's had his say about the kind of the question of Ireland, home rule versus the kind of the spirit of the rising. Um, and then he goes on, obviously he's, he's involved in the Currency Commission, he sits in the Senate, he organizes the Tolkien Games. He's very much about state building. And then he does clearly in the 1930s has his flirtation with the blue shirts. He kind of looks authoritarian in some of his political leanings. So what do we do with his um, political legacy as an Irish person? Um, does he transform and reinvent himself all the time? What, what is he politically, do you think? What's his legacy there? Um, I think that um, it's one of the things that makes Yates, Yates most relevant to us because it gives us an opportunity to think about how we read a, um, poetry and other, other writing that is so um, formally beautiful, but that is coming out of these very kind of right-wing contexts and gives us an opportunity to negotiate in a way kind of that 
that reception um, of his work. And so um, I think that's what we, what we have to do with it. Um, his legacy, his, his political legacy in real terms is um, minuscule. You know, he serves six years um, as a senator and the Irish Free State, um, during which time he makes two or three notable speeches, the most important one in support of the Irish Divorce Bill. Um, but in his time as a senator, he's becoming in increasingly disaffected and um, in a way wish wishing, I think, he hadn't taken up that role. Um, and as soon as his career ends, um, he leaves Ireland um, and spends, um, well, his health, he has a major health crisis. He leaves Ireland and spends a lot of time in Italy. Um, and one of the reasons he goes to Italy, which I write about in my book that's coming about this summer, is what you've um, spoken to there, Mike, about the Talchin Games. Um, he really believes in this idea of a strong state, and he sees the, uh, what Mussolini is doing in Italy um, as being very seductive in terms of what a, what a leader can do, um, how a leader can organize a country around a, a, a national um, culture. Um, but in real flirtation with um, Mussolini is short-lived, but it has a longer lasting impact on, the, on the, the, the way that Yeats writes and the ideas that are motivating his work. I mean, the, the, the Tolkien Games, he was the, for those people who don't know, this was uh, an Irish Olympics that was state in 1924, 28 and 32, the idea you could only compete if you were from Irish heritage. The irony being that the American team on its way back from the real Olympics uh, arrives in Dublin to compete and the winner of the swimming in the pool or the pond in Dublin Zoo is actually Johnny Weissmuller who becomes Tarzan. That's not Yates' fault. Yates' list for who he wants on his committee is fascinating. First of all, he wants Joyce, who refuses. But secondly, on that political question, he wants Denuncio. Denuncio, the inspiration in many ways for kind of Mussolini and Italian fascism. And in a way, Lauren, I'm always intrigued when you walk around Dublin, as you know, one of the kind of the great exhibitions, one of the long running exhibitions has been the Yates in the National Library, now joined by um, Heaney on College Green. And again, it's the idea of, are we as a nation celebrating a writer who is a superlative writer, a Nobel Prize winner, and sweeping that politics to one side? I hope we haven't really confronted that. Well, I think Ireland is also celebrating um, a writer that was very important to building um, the, the reputation of the country, the reputation of the South, of Ireland internationally. In a way, I think through his literary career, legitimizing that state. Um, so I think that's very much what we see in the celebration of Yeats now and in the South, particularly as, as a national poet, is that legitimation of the state. And of course he gave us banknotes and coins, but Joe. <laughs> Uh, well, Mike is the historian here, and, and we're talking about the later Yeats, but I do want to go back to the earlier Yeats and Irish nationalism, and, and, and of course his role as an Irish culture nationalist is, is, is given. Uh, but where did he belong within the pantheon of Irish nationalism? Am, am I right that in, in poems like Easter 1916, he was almost claiming that he started the whole thing? What, what's his real role in your opinion? What's his real role in in the rising? Did you say in the role? Of, in, 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 well, in, I, I should say in the rise of Irish nationalism of what became oh, Irish militant. Where, to what degree was he instrumental in that that led on to everything that we think of now in, in from nineteen sixteen onwards? Yeah, um, I would say. Um, Taking his whole career in account, his most important role in the rise of Irish nationalism is the establishment of the Abbey, which doesn't um, just perform plays written by Abbey playwrights, but also is a venue that is hired out to other nationalist troops that are far more um, advanced in their separatist nationalism than a lot of the Abbey playwrights are. Um, so we see um, the Abbey stage used for nationalist fundraisers, for example, um, and Yates and Lady Gregory make money off of this kind of hiring out, but it also um, provides a space for the organization of national culture that is a space that's not necessarily controlled 
by Yates and Gregory, but it's that kind of material um, gift in a way to nationalism. Right. So, so uh, rather than that play of his that he sort of believed maybe sent young men out to die, not so much the actual instrument you're saying is what he set up, about which I'm hearing that other, other and more uh, nationalistic cultural figures actually accumulated there. Thanks. Thanks. Mike? Just again, moving on from that, I mean, the one thing that's interesting, and your own work talks on it, and you just mentioned Italy and his journeys, how far do we have to kind of reconceptualize Yeats, both in his writing, but also in terms of his cultural networks, not just as Irish, Anglo-Irish, the obvious one to look at, but increasingly do we have to think of Yeats actually as a European? Hmm. Absolutely. So one of the things that um, I've done some research on quite recently um, are his relationships with um, other writers um, in Europe that are not necessarily European writers. So English writers like Basil Bunting and Richard Aldington, American writers like the young poet Louis Zukowski, who he meets in Rapallo. And he's very much a poet of these kinds of European networks. Also for thinking about Yeats in the European, of course, we have to think about his idea of national theater, which is very much coming from um, Ibsen's idea of what theater can do to organize a national idea. Um, the Pirandello's movement for a national theater in Europe. Um, so these are very much um, contexts that are informing what he would like to do in Ireland. And he claims them often without necessarily attributing them. Um, but I think that's the mo probably the most important thing about Yeats is that we don't take him at his word about anything. <laughs> he's, a, he's a plagiarist and a, a pretender. Sorry. Joe. <laughs> That's really lovely. And actually, I can't, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed you telling us that, that, um, that some of his writing you said was very, very funny. I have to say it's the last thing that I would have imagined of Yeats. We think of him as this stalwart, this public man or a private man, but somebody whose writings can be amusing and entertaining. That's really, really uh, absolutely lovely. I want to continue, and I'm, I'm very happy to see lots of questions coming in there, and we'll certainly turn to them very, very shortly. But I want to talk about something about Yeats's influence upon Irish writers later. And I'm thinking about James Heaney, about whom we're going to be speaking in a couple of weeks' time. And Heaney's reported to have said something like this, that, that he had been accused, he said, of writing as if Yeats were looking over his shoulder. And I think his retort was that he would like to think that every poet should write as if Yeats were looking over his shoulder. What is the effect, or what was the effect of Irish poets over the last century indeed of the of of that man looking over their shoulder was the shed, shadow of yates a benign one or was it a dark one what do you think i think what yates gives irish, irish poetry is perfection of the form so we see a poet who writes often formerly near perfect verse mm. out of the most tumultuous circumstances mm -hmm. and we see his working through um kind of emotional upheaval political upheaval in his drafts where he arrives at something that is a work of art that is apart from himself and that can be interpreted apart from himself but that i, I think is often enriched by our, our understanding of him and i see that i think we see that with heaney as well you know um, in a poem, um, sorry, in a collection like North, you know, or even in, say, Death of a Naturalist, the way that he's using the landscape um, to mediate um, that kind of sense of uh, personal trauma um, and a collective trauma into something that's aesthetically apart. Mm -hmm. So a benign effect, at least in the case of Hine, but no dangers about what literary critics call the anxiety of influence. You don't think that it may be stultified Irish poets or writers at all? Well, I think he does help um, create an idea of masculine poetry. Mm. And that's something that Van Boland writes so 
um, wonderfully about about that kind of canon of male nationalist poets mm -hmm. and how there seemed to be very little space for her and for other women to, to find a way in as Irish poets. Uh, you know, gratefully now that has changed um, dramatically. Um, but he does um, he does bring very hard quality to his verse. It's something that Pound identifies and praises in his verse, kind of hard masculine quality. And I think mm -hmm. that it, it uh, made Irish poetry very exclusionary um, right. for a lot of people. Good, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. And that masculinity is, it's a, sorry, that masculinity is quite overt. I mean, the one thing that the small amount of times I've looked at Yeats through my own work is Yeats doesn't come across as a nice man. He's a, a man who seems to have, a, you know, a disastrous personal relationships, damaging personal relationships. Is that part and part of that insecurity we touched at at the beginning, that he's not a kind of fully formed individual? How much of this grandiosity, in a way, is acting out? Absolutely. I think that we see that in his, um, his most successful relationships are with the people... Um, with whom he's the most vulnerable. Um, people like Lady Gregory, with whom he has such a long um, mutual friendship. Um, he's so open with her in ways that he's not um, with other people. Uh, and I don't think he was, I don't think he was um, a, a nice person at all. Um, and I don't think that he was really interested in coming across as a nice person and making himself vulnerable in that way. He was, he was very much always wearing a mask, I think. My goodness. And we have a question actually from Jeffrey Jones precisely about that uh, mask, Yeats' concept of the mask and the influence of Wilde. Yeats, anything to be said there in the mask? Oh, absolutely. Um, the sense that um, in order to create art, it's always necessary to create an, an artifice that's a part from oneself and that one can speak uh, the truth often by speaking um, obliquely um, or best, one can tr speak the truth best by speaking obliquely. And we see that in Yeats's prose, it's very wildy in, um, in that he never hit, comes at anything directly. Um, he always c comes at things from, from the sides. It's one of the things that makes him very difficult um, as a prose writer and also makes him um, more benign, say, than if he had um, spoken uh, more directly about some of his uh, ideas and opinions, particularly his political ones. That's great. That's great. Thank you. And okay. maybe we've got a question which is, which is coming out of that question of his perhaps testosterone-filled poetry. And um, Paul Adir actually is, is thinking about the recitation. And many of us know, and we've heard, of course, Yeats reading the Lake Isle of Inish Free, and Paul says he was struck by the declamatory tone of that. You got the impression, he says, that it was not poetry if it was not delivered by a manner bordering on, he says, pomposity. And he suspects that today's recitations are lower key. Anything to be said about that pomposity and perhaps about how maybe it might nowadays be read? Absolutely. I think part of that is the theatricality. Um, which you've spoken quite a lot about. But it also relates to something which we haven't talked about yet at all, and that's um, his occulticism, um, his experience, um, experiments in magic, and dark arts. Um, and Yeats believed that um, recitation uh, brought uh, power to poetry, and that by having that kind of rhythmic speech, it could evoke this, this other quality. And so I think that that's something uh, important to remember as well. Um, reciting a poem was a little bit like mediumship. One question as well, Lauren, which was on our list, as it were, but has come in as well, is um, asking you about the relationship between W.B. Yeats and George Moore. Um, uh, one of extreme animosity. I would say <laughs> he's very annoyed, <laughs> very annoyed when um, Moore publishes Hail and Farewell because it does such a bad job on him. Um, I'm not an expert on George Moore, so that's probably all, all that I can say about the two of them is that they really hated each other. <laughs> what what that's writers great. do, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
uh, uh, theatre, theatre, theatre we spoke about there a moment ago. And Jeff Stulzer has a question. Can you talk, perhaps, he wonders, about his relative lack of success or acclaim as a playwright? And maybe even his relationship with Sean O'Casey? Because apart from being a poet, he was, he was a theatre manager. He was, great, he was a great manager, is that right, actually, of the Abbey Theatre? But maybe not such a great playwright. Anything you want to say about that? Oh, I think he's a brilliant playwright. Um, and I think that particularly when you look at the late plays, a play like Purgatory, um, you can see how he influences Beckett's aesthetics, um, who Love you'll it. be having a talk on um, a little bit later on. Um, so I think that he um, brings a lot to the theater. Um, a lot of what he brings has to do with um, staging, really, really innovative um, experiments in staging, Wonderful. which maybe haven't um, been recreated all that well um, necessarily in, in productions that people have seen or recreated all that much. Um, and they also don't come across very well on the page. So um, they can be, it can be very difficult to imagine um, uh, Yeats's plays being performed. Um, I think, mm -hmm. but though particularly his late plays are tremendously successful. He is important um, as a, a director of the theater, of course, of giving other much more successful playwrights um, a way in to the business. And O'Casey is one of those. Um, he and O'Casey have a famous falling out over the silver tassie. Um, and that's because um, Yeats often doesn't know even though he's so experimental himself, he often doesn't understand or know how to read experiment um, in the theater. And so he kind of misreads Silver Tassi and doesn't really understand what O'Casey is doing and declines it, says, take it elsewhere. He does the same thing with Dennis Johnston, you know, and the, and the old lady says, no, he says, take it somewhere else. And it becomes tremendously successful at the gate. Um, so he, he sometimes his eye is hit or miss. But what he achieves through the institution of the Abbey is 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 incredibly important. That's that's wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and uh, some more questions that are coming in here, and a number of them are going back to the political questions here. And uh, uh, Guy Biner uh, uh, on Yeats's influence on militant nationalism, and then he turns, of course, to Paul Muldoon and his mischievous as Guy says, quote, uh, that seems apt, if Yeats had saved his pencil lead, would certain men have stayed in bed? That's asking you to make a political judgment, perhaps, rather than an aesthetic one. Is there anything you'd like to say about Muldoon and Yeats and, 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 and I suppose the transformation, perhaps, of, uh, of, of, of opinions about Yeats over the period? Yeah, sure. I think uh, that it would be hard to overestimate the influence of Kathleen Nuhulahan, but that isn't necessarily um, because of Yeats. It's because of that, mm -hmm. um, the public sphere, really, um, that, that that play um, circulates in the way it influences mm -hmm. Pierce's drama at St. Inda's, which mm -hmm. is so integral to kind of militant nationalist education. So I think that, um, that Yeats does play a, a very important role in um, militant nationalism, but maybe it's not the kind of what it's not the kind of direct role that Yeats is toying with in *Man in the Echo* when he kind of questions Kathleen Ulan and that Muldoon is pointing to when Yeats is own questioning. Um, it's something more nebulous um, and something far more networked. Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. Thank you, thank you. I've got a question from Martin McKinsey, actually, a, a point, a suggestion. We've seen Beckett on film, and he wonders perhaps if it's time for Yeats in film. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, gosh, his life is so dynamic and so many uh, uh, amazing personalities. Uh, you know, Maud Gone is the obvious one, but there are others too. Um, and it would be wonderful um, to see a biopic of Yates. It'd be hard to know, though, because he's so different, as you were pointing um, to in the, in the beginning of our talk, Joe, he's so different in these different phases of his life. It'd be hard to know what to zero in on. I don't think you could do it in you know, two hours, the whole thing. It'd be like the crown. You'd and it would be unfair every two episodes. Yeah, he needs a Netflix series, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> it would be totally unfair, Lauren, at this stage to ask, yeah, she'd suggest what actor could play him. <laughs> that's, 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 not, that's not a fair question. Um, uh, please talk, uh, sorry here, I wonder. 
Go on, go on, Mike. No, I was going to say, you've got your lovely question on the epitaph, which... Yes, I have, actually. And, 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 and many of our audience, I think, will have visited Yeats's grave, and they'll have read the epitaph, that self-penned epitaph, cast a cold eye on life, on death, horseman pass by. And there are lines that he, perhaps unsurprisingly, spent a lot of time, I understand, going back to revising, reshaping time and time again, with the certainty that he wished us to gaze upon those lines and to contemplate the life that he led. Cast a cold eye on life, on death, horsemen pass by. Can you possibly tell us what you think those lines are trying to tell us? What do you mean? I think when you um, look at that poem in the context of other late poems, say a poem like Meru, which um, um, is about Mount Everest, really, and the kind of the human intellect um, and these vast, um, terrifying landscapes, really, um, these kind of timeless landscapes. Um, he gives mm -hmm. us this kind of a portrait of... Um, of the, the human mind detached from time and the, the artist's mind detached from time. And I think that that's sort of what he's giving us um, in those lines too, is that idea of himself and a poet, as a poet um, outside of history um, in, these, uh, in these sublime kind of uh, landscapes like in, in the shadow of Ben Bulban, which is kind of an Everest really um, in the Irish sense. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Apparently, people yeah, are saying that it, it should be Daniel Day Lewis playing Yates, but uh, let's not get involved in that debate. Um, no, let's not. I even have a neat and cold Kidman <laughs> suggestion as well gone. That's the one that there will be battles over. <laughs> um, Lauren, obviously, one thing Yates spent quite a lot of time in the United States. Um, I think he visited the US on five different occasions between 1903 and 1933. Uh, sorry, 1903 and 1933. Now, clearly, I mean, America is a completely different construct during that period to, as it were, Yates' Island, Yates' Europe. So can you tell us anything about those tours, about his attitude actually towards America, and then also what America made of him? Yeah. Um, America loves um, that public man. Um, he receives really warm um, reception in national and provincial newspapers. Um, those uh, tours to America are mostly lecture tours where he often gives the same talk um, in different venues. Um, he often goes to the East, starts in the East Coast, kind of New York, Boston, and then goes by train over to Shum from the train um, about the about the American landscape, the kind of vastness of the American landscape. Um, he is interested, though, it has to be said, in America, mostly for the money. Um, he's there to talk to wealthy people about what they can do for his projects in Ireland, you know, much like the Republicans um, tour Ireland um, in the Irish Revolutionary period in order to fundraise. It's, it's, it's a long tradition of doing that. And it starts doing it very early um, for the Abbey, um, particularly to raise money from uh, ex expatriates in, in the States. Thank you. That's great. And we're, we're getting a series of questions actually about, about the plays in particular, uh, Tom Carty there. Which Yates, he wonders, is it that gave us the no, N-O-H, the no series of plays? And um, what is his motive? What's his inspiration? What's the connection to Ireland, if any, in this, in this peculiar set of, 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 of un-Western plays that he produced? What was that about? The, the no plays, the Japanese plays they're asking about? No. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, he becomes interested in um, Japanese theatre because of um, his relationship to Ezra Pound. So he spends um, three winters with Pound from 1913 to 1916 in a tiny cottage in Sussex where they um, simultaneously um, irritate and inspire one another. Um, so Pound is working then on some translations of um, Japanese poetry, um, working particularly on um, manuscripts of Ernest Fenollosa. Um, and 
is sort of telling, um, yeah, it's about the aesthetics that he's finding there. And it's really interested. Um, as you can see in his early work, he's very interested in types. He's very interested in masks. And Japanese theater is very much organized around types, um, around ritual. Um, and that also plays into Yates' yeah, interest in the occult, that role of ritual in the theater. And so he becomes interested in writing his own version of these, uh, of these kind of Jap Japanese plays. Okay, and another question, Lauren. Can you say more about the influence of Yeats on a new generation of women poets in Ireland with the shift mm. away from the more damaging Yeatsian image of the masculine nationalist poet because of the work of Boland and others? Do you see particular ways that younger poets are influenced by his work and style? Uh, I'm thinking specifically of Doreen, uh, Doreen the Griffiner's encantory style of reading performing. Mm. Gosh, that's a really good question. And the, the person who asked that should probably answer it. That's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing exactly. question. It's one of those strange um, ones I'd say that, that there's um, anonymous attendees, so I don't know who it belongs to. I don't know, whoever you are, out yourself, because you've, you've got real insight here into, into contemporary Irish poetry. Um, I would say um, it's his, probably it's his greatest influence there on women, women's poetry or poetry by women um, is the way that he writes about um, parenthood. I'm thinking about the way that he writes about fatherhood um, in um, A Prayer for My Son and A Prayer for My Daughter, the way that he writes about education. He writes very sensitively about children when he chooses, uh, when he chooses to write about, about them at all. And, and um, so that's where I would see a strong influence come from. Again, going back to Boland and her um, kind of night, night feeds, that encountering a child in the dark, I mean, that's something that we find um, in, in Yates as well, kind of saying a, a benediction over them. I think that, that's, that's drawn from Yates there. And thanks, Lauren. And I see a question from Carlos. It's nice to see your calling. And that's for me here. We just mentioned but Colin wonders about what he calls Yeats's ghostly apparitions elsewhere. I guess he's speaking about his universality there in India, Japan, and Nigeria. What is it that makes him travel so well? And and Colin has got a, a little rider to that because he wonders: does he still travel as well, or perhaps has he been eclipsed by others? I think. One of the reasons he travels so well is the simplicity of his lines. So um, thinking about the second coming, which I think which is one of his most quoted um, poems, um, a line like things fall apart, which finds its way, you know, speaking to, um, you know, the financial crisis to um, African decolonization um, and Achebe, um, you know, his, his lines can in a way um, be disconnected from the poems of which they're a part, because they each line speaks um, is a, is sometimes a poem in itself, um, and so I think that that's why he travels so well. Um, I don't think his traveling has come to an end. I mean, he made it all the way into the Sopranos, so um, I think his, his poetry has a has a <laughs> has a lot of a lot of miles left. So we're not talking about sound bites. Go on, Mike, please. No, no, no. What, what do you think, Lauren, that we should know that perhaps we don't know about W.B. Yeats? Um, I think it's, it's something we talked about earlier, which is that element of self-questioning and that kind of vulnerability because he's so good at disguising that in kind of stony edifice. Um, when you know that he was someone who doubted himself really at every juncture, who doubted his relationships, who, um, who struggled um, as a writer intensely. When you look at the manuscript dress, how, how hard he worked, how much labor um, he put into his poems and how he questioned his work. Um, I think when you know that about him, um, that kind of soft, soft belly, as it were, it becomes um, in some, to some degree more relatable, easier to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that we're hearing more about the, the Yeats whom we don't immediately see, 
that strident public figure, even though, of course, we, we know of him in later life as perhaps as he looks upon the anxiety of old age and the body and the soul, that, that falling apart body and the spirit within that's desperate to keep on going. Anything that you'd like to tell us about the old age Yeats for those of us who are heading in that direction? <laughs> um, the last 10 years of Yeats's life, I think, were the most dynamic. He did an extraordinary amount between wow. the publication of The Winding Stair in 1929 and his death on the 28th of January in 1939. He launched new publishing adventures. He had new experiments in the theater. He wrote some of the poetry of which sort of, he judged the best in his own corpus. He had a, a creative resurgence um, in the last 10 years of his life after experiencing a period of um, depression and, and what he described as a kind of deep bitterness. Um, so I would say that that late Yates is joyful. Um, he's not afraid to take yeah. chances. Um, he <laughs> embarks on new relationships in all kinds of ways. Um, and uh, he's really a poet of celebration. That's, that's okay. absolutely wonderful. That's, I mean, that's very, very lovely to hear, I have to say, Mike. I was going to tell you, it's just another question that's come in. I wonder what uh, Lauren makes about how symbolism in Yeats's plays become more inward-looking and impenetrable later on. In the opening of The Death of Colcullen, when the old man says he wants an audience of, quote, 50 or 100, was Yeats giving up on his cultural ambitions for Irish society or parodying how critics viewed him? Can we take this or him seriously? So you're right. Um, they are um, more, you might say, more secret, um, those codes in his late, late plays. And, some, and to some degree, his poetry as well. Um, and that's because he, um, he's exhausted I'd say, uh, trying to make mm -hmm. himself um, known and understood um, to an audience that is intent on either misunderstanding him or, in his view, can't understand him. And so he becomes very elite in those kinds of dramatic codes. Um, his plays are still um, aesthetically very pleasing, but, say, the... the the meaning, the, the kind of core of them is something that can only really be understood by reading his commentaries on the plays, which often weren't available to his audience, to reading letters in which he's writing about and his working through the drafts and his um, imagined kind of stagings. Um, so they, they can only really be um, understood with all of that um, paratextual evidence. Yeah, that's because he's really intent um, at that stage of his career of being an, an elite playwright. He's not, he's not interested in being a popular playwright. He's already made it as a national poet. Um, he hasn't really got anything to lose in his view, I think. That's really marvellous, marvellous. He said at one stage, uh, Lord, he said that a poet's life is an experiment in living. And it does sound from everything you've said that he was experimenting all the time. And he, is there anything that we might learn today, actually, from these experiments? Does that tell us anything about the lives that we should be living, experimental? Um, well, I hesitate to um, use Yates as a, as a model for living, um, particularly because I disagree so profoundly um, with his ethics. But I think his risk-taking um, <laughs> is something that is, is safe to say. Um, we can be inspired by. Um, also his, um, his willingness kind of to embark on new ventures, thinking about a broad, the broadside ballads that um, he uh, launches with F.R. Higgins in 1935. So it's, he's four years from his death and he starts a new publishing venture. Um, I'd, I'd say um, that that's really what, what we can take away. I mean, that does seem one thing about Yeats is he's not a man for sitting still across his life. Um, just another question then, um, Lauren. In a packet for Ezra Pound, Yeats describes Pound's 
poetry as being the opposite of his own. Any idea what he means by this? So Pan's, um, particularly Pan's um, cantos from the 30s, from the 1930 onward, are increasingly entangled with immediate political context. Um, as we mentioned earlier, Yeats is really interested in Mussolini, and partly that's because of what Pound is telling him about Mussolini. But Yeats really quickly turns against um, Mussolini's um, version of fascism um, and any kind of fascist politics in the real world. Um, so Yeats is uh, where, where Pound is becoming an increasingly political poet and then want, and, and that he's one that's engaged with those contexts. Yeats is interested in creating a, a work that is still, in my view, very totalitarian, but it, that is sealed off from any immediate kind of political reference that isn't tied to any particular uh, political leader. Um, and so in that way, um, his work is the opposite. But they both, of course, continue to take inspiration from uh, what we refer to as the classical texts. So um, Yeats's interpretation of Greek drama, um, Pound's poetry that's modeled so strongly on Dante, they're still, they're still drawing from, in many ways, similar sources. But the way that they present their ideas could be perceived as opposite. Thanks, 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 Lauren. That's really excellent. I, I want to ask a question about, I was going to ask you uh, about what's your favourite um, Yeats poem, but that's not a fair thing to ask. I guess I'm going to ask perhaps, is, is there a poem that you would say that might be relevant for today, considering the times that we're in? A man who lived through so much strife and who spent his life struggling against, against and was aware of the great movements in history that were happening around him, indeed, and articulated them so gorgeously. I mean, here we are in the word that's, that's what we know where it is. Is there somewhere to which you would turn, or that we might perhaps turn any particular poem in Yeats that might be useful to us right now? I would say for me, it's the poem, The Wild Swans at Cool, which often pops into my head, kind of unbidden these days, and no longer just in the autumn. Um, because it's a poem, um, as we're, as we're sort of forced in a way to um, spend more time in solitude um, when we're able to spend more time in the natural world um, as we can distance ourselves from other people um, and have those new encounters. Um, the Wild Swans at Cool is an appreciation of that kind of beauty and solitude. It's also a poem of great loss of Melan of melancholy, um, but of peace and stillness at the same time. And Francis O'Gorman has a really beautiful um, essay that came out quite recently um, on Yeats's stillness, stillnesses. And um, for me, The Wild Swans at Cool is one of those still poems in which we can take refuge. Thanks very much. That's really, really helpful. I think that's 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 a nice way. And uh, we're coming towards the end. And uh, and I think actually that I'm I'm about to say um, a thank you to everybody. Um, and thanks for the very many questions that we got in here. Kelly Sullivan, thanks, Lauren. We should resurrect our film project idea. And that's been the buzz of the evening, actually, uh, with with a series of names coming. Hugh Grant, we're hearing here. Hugh Grant, perhaps for uh, for Yates. And another suggestion on Tom Hiddleston. I don't know who Tom Hiddleston is. Somebody else uh, does. And I hear Alan Cummings is being suggested by Emily Bloom. Thanks very much, Emily. Thanks, Kelly. And thanks for from, uh, I think, uh, Marjorie's actually throwing in names there too. Uh, Nick. Old Kidman, we're saying here, of course, says Maud Gunn McBride. So listen, lovely, lovely questions. Who's going to take this in hand? Um, we are going to be later on in the series talking to uh, Lenny Abrahamson. So who knows if we're not able to actually maybe wheedle our way into his into his uh, good good offices and get him to uh, to do that for us. Um, I think um, uh, Mike. I'm not too sure that I've missed you, Mike. Are you are you there? Perhaps you're having some difficulty with the cameras. But let me say thank you awfully very awfully much to Lauren for coming to us. Ah. 
here we are back actually to looking at, I think, next week's one. Thank you very much, Lauren, for being with us. That's been really, really a wonderful conversation and a series of, of thank yous for many people actually for the insights you gave us and for the very, very lovely, lovely background to what Yates was about. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. And let's not just stop there because uh, we're continuing the series with the Nobel laureates. And as you see there in front of you, this coming week, we have Lois Moore Overbeck from Emory University, a great Beckett scholar. And she's going to talk to us about Samuel Beckett and thinking about what we were told this evening by Lauren, actually, and did the influence of Yeats's plays on Beckett. Let's see if we don't find some continuity along the way here. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, everybody. And I'm not going to quite finish there because I want to remind you before I go that on Monday of the following week, Monday next, that is, I think Americans say, Monday the 8th, I'm going to be talking to um, Joseph Valenti uh, and Marco Bacchus. And this is not quite actually in the Irish influence, but they have published recently their book, of course, that's called The Child Sex Scandal and Modern Irish Literature. It's a very, very powerful book. And indeed, in that conversation, the pair of those two great scholars are going to be responded to by our own Kate Costello Sullivan, of course, the president of ACES and, uh, and, and our great friend. Um, and I think that's it for tonight. Thank you, everybody, very, very much. Thanks again, Lauren. Thanks, Christian. Uh, thanks, Mike. And thank you all for being here, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.